All right. I would like to continue the discussion now um, on you know on bone tissue itself. In the previous video, I discussed the the very basics of the development of bone tissue and some of the basics about cells within tissue. Now let's talk about after bones are developed, how the cells arrange themselves, and you know what bone tissue is essentially going to be like underneath a microscope, and how that provides the function of bones. All right. And again, before I start showing you pictures and talking about bone and tissue, let's again review this terminology. Um, you know, uh, remember lamellae is ba essentially layers, and I'll, you'll see how essentially the, the matrix of bone tissue is layered on top of one another that provides it with, uh, you know, the, the, the strength of the tissue. And then you'll see what are called lacunae or cavities that, um, that the osteocytes, the cells of bone, are embedded within and then these osteocytes will create what are called the canaliculi, uh, <coughs> excuse me, little canals which are important or are imperative to the survival of these cells. And then, you know, the most of the bone we're going to be looking at is um, compact bone um, which is essentially uh, which which is formed by these functional units called osteons or or in other books they will be called haversion systems okay um, you'll probably hear me use osteons more often okay and then remember we've already discussed basically cancellous bone or spongy bone and trabeculae the little beams that make up spongy bone and then after I'm done talking about the the, the histology of, of bone, no, compact bone, I want to talk more about the remodeling process of bone tissue itself. Okay, so if we want to take a look at compact bone, all right, what you're going to see here is I want to jump ahead a little bit just to this picture. What you're gonna what you're gonna see here are essentially um, layers of bone developed around blood vessels and nerves okay and these and basically these circular layers of bone that develop around these um, around these blood vessels and nerves one singular circle around here and all the matrix and tissue around it is what's called an osteon okay that's essentially what an osteon is now um, now, essentially, now what you see here, remember when I talked about the matrix of bone tissue, okay, remember I said about one-third of it is organic, okay, and two-thirds of it is inorganic, but essentially minerals, okay. That one-third organic is primarily collagen and then other pro, you know, proteoglycans and uh, other proteins that make up the gel-like ground substance of bone. Okay, now what you see here, these bluish colored lines, okay, what that is, that's the, those are essentially collagen fibers. Okay, and you don't really find the collagen fibers in, a, in, real, in any kind of, excuse me, in any kind of specific arrangement. Okay, but bear in mind, you know, just the presence of collagen gives bone, you know, its tensile strength. Okay, remember, collagen fibers are a thick, you know, compact, pro, you know, a big, thick protein. Okay, and then when you pile a lot of collagen fibers and weave them together within bone, okay, that's going to allow that tissue to become very, very strong. And then bear in mind that we mineralize the collagen by mixing it with inorganic calcium salts and other minerals as well. Okay. Now, one thing I want to mention uh, before I kind of get in, before I get into this, you know, if we kind of jump back a little bit and take a look at this compact bone here, you know, so what you can see here, so this would be one layer, this would be a layer, okay, this would be a layer, that's a layer, okay, those are the lamellae. Okay, those are the, those are the layers. Okay, so essentially, bear in mind that within the central canal. Okay, some books will call it a central canal, some books will call it a haversion canal. Okay, remember haversion systems. Okay, but bear in mind that there are arteries, there are veins in here, and then green is going to represent the nerve in this situation. Okay, and then these nerves and then these, these vessels essentially, you know, form, uh, you know, supply blood to the surrounding cells. So basically these black specks you see here, those are osteocytes. Okay, now remember these osteocytes started out as osteoblasts, okay, but then they eventually became engulfed within this bony, within this tough bony matrix. Okay, and then remember those osteocytes, what they look like, they're a cell, they got the nucleus, and they have a lot of extensions. 
okay, branching off of them. Okay, now those extensions are important, and I'll show you a better image of this in a little bit, but, those, but basically you can kind of see what looks like these rough little lines here. Those are the extensions off the cytoplasm of these cells. Now essentially what these, what these osteocytes are doing is they're growing these extensions and forming this interconnection with one another, okay? And basically what they're, what they're essentially doing is they're branching out towards the central canal. Okay, they're branching out towards the central canal and each other. So essentially, this central canal is the lifeline of the osteon. Okay, because that's where the you know that's where the nourishment is. Okay, so basically, the cells that are brand so as these cells are branching out towards the haversion or central canal, they're basically trying to gather oxygen and nutrients from the bloodstream, and then they interconnect with one another. Remember a while ago, I mentioned gap junctions. When I was talking about cells, okay, remember gap junctions are found, you know, in between cells that interconnect one another. They're essentially gates or transport, um, you know, they're little proteins, okay, that, that, that act as gates. So essentially these outer mode, these more outer cells, so as, as these inner cells collect oxygen and nutrients, they can, you know, these gap junctions can be used to transfer through the extensions, you know, from the cells of the inner part of the osteon to the cells out in the periphery, okay. So, so you can see the lamellae, the layers of the of compact bone. Okay, and then you can't see it very well, but I'll show you a picture of this in a little bit. These little grooves or these lines here would essentially be the cannuliculi, the little canals where the osteons are branching out to get to each other and towards the central canal. Okay, and then again, the lacunae are these spaces that the osteocytes are embedded within themselves. All right. So that's a, so, and then and then bear in mind that this compact bone is not just one osteon; it's many of them, you know, piled on top of one another. So you've got one osteon. So this would essentially be one osteon. Okay. Then you've got another osteon. Okay. And then there are many of these that are that are formed. And then so so think of it as like taking a bunch of pencils and putting them together in your hand. Okay. So let's say you take uh, one or two pencils and you hold them in your hand and you try to break them. Okay, that's going to, you know, that's not going to be uh, very strong. Okay, but if we kind of jump ahead and take a look at this here, you can see this, this arrangement of the osteons. Okay, so you can see, again, the lamellae here, the, the layers, all right, of compact bone. And then you can see these would be the osteocytes within the lacunae, and then you don't see the cannuliculi of the extensions here. But when you stack all these, this dense bone on top of each other, okay, these osteons, you make for one really strong tissue. Because remember, this is mineralized tissue, all right? Very, very mineralized tissue. So then as a result, you make for a very, very strong bone. You know, so think of taking a handful of pencils. Take about taking, let's say you take 20 unsharpened pencils, number two pencils, and hold them. And you try to break that whole unit, okay, as one singular unit. It's, you're not going to break through the whole thing very easily just because when you stack all those circular units together, you make a very strong structure, okay? Now, these... Um, now you can notice again that there that as these blood vessels kind of wind through these haversion canals, okay, they branch out into again into these perforating canals called Volkmann's canals that supply again the osteocytes, these living cells with blood. Okay. Um where was I gonna go with that? I uh, that's just what these are. These are you know Volkmann's canals, they supply really I guess I wasn't really gonna go anywhere with that. Um Yeah, so I guess I really wasn't going to go anywhere else with that. And then you can see here, sorry about the hiccup in the in the head there. Okay, and then you can see again, as I mentioned in the previous video, that all bones have a periosteum around them. And you can see how this is where the nerves and vessels, how they integrate themselves into the bone. And then remember also within this periosteum, there are osteogenic cells that are that come in quite handy. Um you know, if, if we break a bone. So remember, on the very outer edges of this bone, there are, there are still osteoblasts, okay? And then, you know, within, you know, within the bone itself are the osteocytes, all these yellow specks you see here, all right? 
And then I, I, I don't know why I put this here in this spot, but I guess I was just going to show you the difference between spongy and compact bone. All right, but again, you can see the very compact, tough nature of compact bone, and then you can see the very, the more spaced. You know, you can see the the spore, the pores, and the trabeculae of spongy bone. This right here is a growth plate. Okay, and then this would be the compact bone with you know within the diaphysis, and this would be the medullary cavity that has yellow bone marrow. So again, spongy bone is a lot more porous. Okay, now like I said though, compact bone is not solid like a tabletop; it is porous as well. Okay, but you know the the pores are essentially just these these uh, haversion or central canals for blood vessels to supply the surrounding osteocytes. Okay, now about the mineralization of this bone. So remember, as I mentioned in the previous talk as well, that as we're forming this these this layered this this lamellar bony matrix, okay, remember that it's a combination of essentially collagen and hydroxyapatite. Okay, so a, a calcium salt that's mixed with phosphates. Okay, so so now. The question you should be asking yourself then is we have a, I mean we have a lot of calcium and phosphate circulating in the in the in the in the, t in the tissues as well. We have calcium bound to plasma proteins. We have calcium in our in our t in our interstitial fluid, our fluid spaces of our tissues. There are some just free calcium circulating around. There's phosphates in the in the tissue spaces of our body as well. So why don't and there's proteins as well. Why don't we form how come the, how come we don't form minerals and or minerals? How come we don't form you know these these hard crystals in our tissues as well? And the reason why is because there are certain inhibiting factors that prevent calcification from taking place. Okay, so but within bone, okay, bone tissue, you know whether it's compact, you're talking about the trabeculae of the spongy bone. Okay, those inhibiting chemicals that are normally found in your blood and tissue fluids are not present. So then as a result, when you start mixing collagen and minerals together, okay, they start to they start to bind with one another and then you form this really dense hard crystal. So that's how bone is allowed to form, okay, essentially when you mix these two together. Because like I said, those inhibiting factors are just not present. All right, and there are certain conditions when calcification does take place outside of bone. You know, for example, you know, if you have uh, atherosclerosis taking place, if I damage a vessel, okay, calcium gets you know within the within the the tissue spaces of that vessel, you know, where there may not be those inhibiting um, factors present, you know, that this this vessel is going to calcify and become very hard. It's just going to be more or less like a bony artery, okay. Um, so that's how calcification is allowed to take place within bone, within this bone tissue itself. And then here's a tissue slide of these haversion systems, again, or these osteons, as I mentioned. Again, you can see this is one osteon right there. This is one osteon right there. This is an osteon. This is an osteon. That's an osteon. Okay. And again, when you take all of those, all of this really calcified bony tissue and you, and you pack it together like this, these circular units together, it makes bone very, very strong. And this compact bone is very good at resisting compressive type forces, okay, and, and stretching forces as well. I mean, that, remember, that's the presence of collagen, okay, you know, tensile forces, okay, you know, so basically it's, it's bone is resistant to stretch, all right. And then you mineralize it, and it just makes it even more strong. Now, I get, some students ask this sometimes, and I'm just going to bring this up now. Um, I mean, it's not silly just because, I mean, yeah, it's part of the learning process. Um, but you, you can't tell a person's age by counting the osteons, okay? Because some people look at this, and it's good to see people trying to connect dots. But you got to remember that we're not a tree, okay? You can't count the rings of a bone and tell the age of a person, all right? Keep that in mind. Okay, so again, all these specks you see here, these are essentially the osteocytes, the cells embedded within the, within the bony matrix or that hardened tissue. All right, and then here's a more close-up look at this compact bone that you can see here. So here would be a haversion or a central canal, and then you can see these osteocytes, okay, forming these cannuliculi or these little, um, these little canals. And then you can see the interconnected nature of these osteocytes Okay, as they, you know, again, this is how they can kind of nourish and keep each other going. All right, as they're as they're receiving blood from those perforating canals off of here.
Okay, so um, and then here's an actual tissue sam an actual tissue slide of this. Again, this would be an osteocyte, and then the space that that osteocyte is sitting within is again the lacunae or the or a space that's occupied by the cell, and then you can see the branching nature of these osteocytes as they interconnect with one another. Okay, so then remember, as we, as you saw that image of the oste as the oste of the, I'm sorry, of the osteon earlier, you saw that arteries pass, you know, up through the osteon, and and then what happens are these arteries branch out, okay, through these perforating or what are called Volkmann's canals with into the tissue into the tissue spaces of the compact bone. Okay, so now you've got these interconnected cells, okay, that that branch towards these vessels that can grab oxygen and nutrients and eliminate waste into the, well, of course, not in the arteries, but into the bloodstream. Okay, so that's the importance of the interconnected nature of these osteocytes. And again, here's just another image of the osteon as well. All right, you know, again, the central canal, the, the lamellae, you know, the layers, the osteocytes, the cannuliculi formed by the extensions. Okay, and you can't see a perforating canal here, but they're within, but they're within here. And again, the, the kind of syncytium or the connective nature that these um, cells form just, again, allows them to gather nutrients more readily. Okay, so that's essentially, I mean, in a nutshell, that's essentially compact bone. It's just a, it's just a heart, it, it, it's just a composition of these circular osteons with cells engulfed in a, in a tough mineralized matrix. And then, which kind of leads me to, to the next topic, I want to talk about bone remodeling and calcium homeostasis. Okay, now re, what remodeling is, again, I mentioned that it's a sum of two separate processes, bone deposition and bone resorption. Okay, so essentially deposition is when bone is, is when we're building bone and resorption is when we're breaking down bone. Okay, so deposition, uh, you know, the, the cells that are responsible for this are osteoblasts. Okay, and then the cells that are responsible for resorption are osteo clasts. All right, and then these two cells are constantly breaking down and building up bone tissue. And there's and there's a, a, a important reasons as to why this must take place. Okay, one of them is just a replacement of old bone. You have to remember there are living cells and there are proteins. There's organic material within this bony tissue. And remember, organic materials do break down over time. You know, they could break down as a result of stress or age. All right. So then it's important that remember, as I talked about osteoclasts a little while uh, in, in the previous video, osteoclasts are derivatives of phagocytes. Okay. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, they come from monocytes and bone marrow, which are a type of phagocyte. So then essentially what these osteoclasts do is they'll phagocytize, they'll consume the dead, you know, whether it's dead, you know, broken down collagen fibers or, um, you know, old, you know, dead cells, and they'll digest, and they'll digest and break them down. Okay. And then the osteoblast can then lay down new bone tissue where the, you know, where the old dead cells were uh, you know, were previously located. So this, pro so the process of remodeling is important for the replacement of bone. Okay, and the, remember, these two processes are occurring normally in equal proportions. Okay, we're breaking down. Okay, we're breaking bone bone down at an equal rate of building it up. All right. So as we break down and, and as we break down old bone cells and bone tissue, we replace it at an equal rate. Okay, adjustment to stress. Remodeling is extremely important for this because bones are very sensitive to mechanical stress. Okay, this is why, I mean, athletes have thicker bones than non-athletes, okay? So, for example, your textbook, uh, you know, Mary, uh, Hohen and Mariab, okay, talk about tennis players. And I think that's a very good example. Okay, so with tennis players, tennis players obviously predominantly use one arm more than another. All right, so let's say I'm playing tennis and I'm right-handed. I serve, I forehand. I mean, the forehand is the, you know, the main shot in racket sports. Okay, I mean, the backhand is used a lot, but the forehand is just the primary shot. Okay, the primary stroke. I mean, you don't see many people serving backhand in tennis. Okay, so what's, so let's say this would be... Okay, so let's say this is my right arm, 
and this would be my left arm. Okay, my right arm, you know, my plane arm is obviously going to be more dense. It's going to be more thick, okay, due to the increased stress, the increased mechanical stress that's taking place. Okay, so as I'm constantly using the bone, okay, now, now I'm not using the bone in this case, but I'm using the muscles that are attached to bone. Remember, bones act as levers for muscles to pull on. Okay, so when muscles are contracting, they'll be pulling on bones. And that and that mechanical force that, that muscles exert on bones is going to force the bones to add more tissue. They have to be more thick in response to this. If this did not happen, our muscles would break our bones apart. Because remember, as you exercise, you know, muscles do, you know, muscles enlarge. And if our bones do not enlarge in response or proportion to the muscles, I mean, we, we, we destroy our bone tissue. Okay, so essentially the bone in my serving arm and my right arm is going to be larger than that of my left, okay, because of the, the, the constant stress. Okay, you, you know, you, you could see this in, I mean, it's someone that has a cast. Okay, if there is less stress, okay, on the bone, the osteoclast activity is going to be more, is going to, you know, you're going to see more of this than the depositing activity and the bone is going to lessen. Why? Because the mechanical stress that muscles apply at bones is just not going to be there. Okay, if you immobilize a limb for a while, you're going to lose the mass of the muscle and the bone as well. So muscles and bones have a very intricate relationship with one another. Okay, you know, muscle activity influences bone density. All right, and I mean, that's what, we, you know, the, your textbook talks about. It's called Wolf's Law. Okay, Wolf's Law of Remodeling. Okay, that bones respond to mechanical stress. All right. So, so how? So essentially, let's talk a little bit about how this works. Um, so, when this process takes place, when this process takes place, whether it's breaking down old bone tissue or replacing, let's talk about the individual activity of osteoclast and osteoblast. All right, osteo. Okay, osteoblast, what they essentially do, they're a little more simple, because remember, you know, there are these cells, small extensions, they have a nucleus, and there's a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so essentially these cells are going to synthesize collagen fibers and export them out of the cell. All right, and then you got to remember that these are, you know, that this the bone is a tissue like any other tissue. There's blood flowing to um, bony tissue. So then, as so then, as blood flows to the, as blood flows to you know to to the inner workings of the, of the bone. Okay, uh, we're gonna have you know fluids filter out like any other tissue. Okay, and then some calcium and other minerals and and whatever else is in blood that that can filter out of capillaries is gonna get into the tissue spaces. Okay, so then so as we're laying down more collagen fibers, all right, this calcium is going to stick to the bony tissue all right and then that's going to we're going to develop more matrix and then eventually this osteoblast is going to be engulfed within all this new matrix and then it's again it will be just considered a functional osteocyte okay so osteoclasts what these do these do about the exact opposite all right what osteoclasts do is Okay, so what osteoclasts do, remember osteoclasts have many nuclei, all right, what these do is they do a couple of things. One, they'll phagocytize the organic material of bone, whether it's a dead, broken down cell or whether it's, you know, bro uh, collagen fibers, okay, osteoclasts are going to phagocytize that organic material and digest it and take away bone tissue, okay, but, and then if we want to separate the minerals, okay, from the from the proteins, that's when they start to release acids. Okay, they release acids, and that makes the pro and that disrupts the 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 bonding, the forces that that hold the minerals and the protein together. Okay, and so now the question is, how are these? You know, when how are these cells activated? Okay, how are osteoblasts and osteoclasts activated? How do we actually know when and how to use them for the remodeling process? And essentially, there's a couple different, you know, there's there's a couple different situations in which we would see this. Okay, so for starters, let's talk about, you know, and let's talk about calcium homeostasis. 
Okay, because how we regulate calcium and mechanical, you know, it, it, how we regulate calcium essentially plays a role in how these how these cells are activated and how we utilize them as well. Okay, so let's talk about hypocalcemia. Let's say we get low and let, let's say our, our 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 calcium levels are getting low. Okay, there's a couple of different there's a couple of different ways that we can get our calcium levels back up to normal. Okay, one of them is to increase absorption. Okay, and this is where vitamin D comes in handy. This is where a hormone called parathyroid hormone comes in handy. Okay, and we could also increase renal retention. Okay, increase renal retention. Okay, and again, this is where a hormone, parathyroid hormone, comes in handy. All right, so the parathyroid. So let's talk about this parathyroid hormone for a second. Parathyroid hormone. It's a hormone that is um, that is that is excreted from what are called the parathyroid glands. Okay, and they're loc and the parathyroid glands are located on the posterior of the thyroid. All right, and people typically have about four of these glands, okay? So you've got four of these, they look like little nodules on the posterior side of the, um, of the thyroid gland. And their main responsibility is to excrete this hormone, parathyroid hormone, okay? And, they, and these glands are extremely sensitive to changes in your, in, your, in your blood calcium levels, okay? So if your calcium levels start to take a dip, okay, these cells are, you know, there are certain molecular mechanisms um, secondary messenger systems are called G protein messenger systems to be specific. Okay, and when these when these systems are activated, these cells will start to excrete parathyroid hormone into the bloodstream. Okay, once calcium starts to dip a little too low. All right, so there's a couple. So there's a couple of things then that parathyroid hormone is going to do. One is it's going to take its effects on the kidneys. Okay, one is, you know, and it's going to make the kidneys do two things. One, it will help. They will help stimulate the kidneys to retain calcium. So the less calcium you excrete in your urine, the more that is retained within your body. So parathyroid hormone increases renal retention of calcium. Okay. Parathyroid hormone increases renal retention. And also with the kidneys, what it's going to do is it's going to increase the production of a hormone called calcitriol. Okay, calcitriol is essentially the active form of vitamin D, okay? Now, what vitamin D is going to do then is it's going to increase our ability, to, this calcitriol, is it's going to increase our ability to absorb calcium, okay? So, it's going to make it easier for our GI tract to get calcium into our system, okay? So, the combination of these two is, will, you know, will help get our calcium levels back up. Okay, there's another thing that um, parathyroid hormone is going to do, and that is the activation of osteoclasts. Okay, it's going to activate osteoclasts, okay? So, essentially what's going to happen then is when we activate these, when we activate osteoclasts, you, I mean, we already explained what they do, you know, you're going to increase the activity of these cells. They're going to do two things. One, they're going to release these acids that are going to denature the proteins. Okay, that'll unwind these that'll unwind these proteins, and that'll disrupt the forces that are keeping the proteins and the salt minerals together. And then what's going to happen are, and this is the important part, is getting is getting the calcium salts separated from the proteins. So then the acids will separate these, and then these, these, um, these, these calcium minerals then can get into the blood. Okay, again, thus increasing blood calcium levels. Okay, so the combination of increasing renal retention, increasing intestinal absorption, and activating osteoclasts will help get our calcium levels back up to normal. Okay, because hypocalcemia can be a dangerous situation if we don't correct this. Okay, what, you know, typically what you're going to see you're gonna, with hypocalcemia, you're going to see neurologic issues. You know, for example, nerves are going to become hyper-excitable because without, with low levels of calcium, neurons are more permeable to sodium and they're much more excitable. Okay, you, so 
then as a result, these, you know, these excitable nerves are going to increase muscle tension. And what you'll see is you'll see people, you'll see this in the face because a small, I mean, small muscles are always the first you see problems with. And then what you're going to see as, as you see the increase in the erratic activities of the nerves, okay, you're going to see what's called a carpal pedal spasm. Okay, or tetany. Okay, tetany. Okay, so what's going to happen then are basically your your flexing muscles of your forearm and your feet are going to go into spasm. Now you have more and more powerful flexor than extensor muscles, and once they go into spasm, you're going to see the wrists and the fingers curl, and it's going to get really, really painful. Okay, and if hypocalcemia gets even more severe, you may see cardiac complications as well, but that would be a very, very severe case of this. All right. So parathyroid hormone, it can be used to activate osteoclasts in situations when our calcium levels get too low. Okay, osteoclasts are going to be active normally as well, you know, again, because cells are dying, collagen fibers are falling apart within bone, we need to clean up that mess. Okay, but this would be a special situation when we need to utilize this activity more. Okay, now think about this for a second, though. Let's say, let's think of a pathologic situation where you had... Uh, where we had increased or too much parathyroid hormone in the body. You had hyperparathyroidism. Think about what's going to happen to your bones in this situation. Okay, you increase the, secre the excretion of parathyroid hormone. Okay, now you have more osteoclast activity. You, so you have these cells, you have more, too many cells excreting too much acid into the, into the bony environment, and you're releasing too much calcium. So as you get as you get those calcium more and more calcium salts out of the bone and you lower the bone density of the bone that's going to make the bones become a lot more soft so you'll develop something called osteomalacia okay osteomalacia the bones are going to get they're they're going to get more thin and they're going to get more soft well thinning that would be osteopenia Okay, now obviously you can think of the risk of this situation then. As the bones get more thin, they're going to become more brittle and then they're going to break very easily. Okay, and that's bad because we don't want bones breaking because they could, you know, I mean, that could cause bleeding, that could, you know, cause the rupturing of nearby tissues. It's just a bad situation in general. Plus, that's going to disrupt your calcium homeostasis. All right, and then uh, think about in lab when we soaked the bone in vinegar. Okay, when we in, in the, you know the acidic nature of the vinegar acted like the acids from the osteoclast. So that acid separated, okay, the calcium from the from the collagen, and as a result, the I mean you I mean you guys were seeing you were literally grabbing the, the the bones and bending them and twisting them a lot more than you probably expected. You saw that they were very rubbery and very soft. Okay, and that's because we demineralized the bone. All right, and then the op and then the opposite situation of that then is if let's say we are hypercalcemic. Okay, we will utilize a hormone called calcitonin. Okay, which basically does the opposite of what we were talking about. It's going to increase osteoblast activity. Now, basically, it does this by decreasing osteoclast activity. Okay, so then once we decrease osteoclast activity, osteoblasts can excrete more collagen, and then there's more for these calcium salts to bind to as blood is circulating through bone. Okay, and then um, that allows bone to become more mineralized. And this is, now calcitonin in adults really is not, you know, problems with calcitonin, if you're, if you're deficient in calcitonin in adults, not that big a deal. You have a lot of minerals in your bones. Your bones are big and thick. Okay, there's just not that big of an issue. Now, if you're a child and you have low calcitonin levels, that's bad. Okay, because, you know, as your bones are growing at a rapid rate and there's that constant need for mineralization to take place, okay, the calcitonin comes from the thyroid, by the way. Okay, um, you know, what, I mean, you can probably do the math on what's going to happen. If a, if a kid is deficient in calcitonin, they're going to be lower in height. Okay, not good. Okay, so calcitonin deficiencies in adults does not lead to a good situation. Okay, so we essentially regulate calcium by utilizing our bones, okay, by utilizing the activity of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. 
okay, and we hormonally control the activities of these cells in these extenuating circumstances, okay, whether we're hyper or hypocalcemic. All right, parathyroid hormone activates osteoclast, and bear in mind, that's a, and that kind of allows us to go back to another example, negative feedback as well. Okay, remember the, remember the concept of negative feedback. It's where, you know, it's a loop that's designed to negate a stimulus. Okay, so obviously the stimulus in this situation is hypocalcemia. All right, so then as a result, we secrete parathyroid hormone. We activate osteoclasts. Okay, and then once our blood calcium levels get back up to normal, then we shut off the, the excretion of parathyroid hormone. We decrease osteoclast activity because, again, we don't want to be breaking down too much of bone tissue. So the use of parathyroid hormone, this is not a good long-term measure to get our calcium levels back up. It's only a short-term ordeal. Okay. So keep that in mind, osteoclast, osteoblast. And again, you know, bones also remodel not just through hormonal stimulation, but mechanical as well. Okay, mechanical stress that's applied to them. All right, so essentially, um, so essentially when you, when you, you know, let's say you're talking about an athlete again, you know, when you're using those pulling or compressive forces that are applied to bone, all right, you're going you're gonna to force the bones to essentially lay down more tissue. Now, it's not well understood exactly how the mechanical stress forces bone to do this. Um, you know, I read that essentially, I, you know, I read somewhere that, um, that, you know, that bones, like, you know, bone cells, bone tissues, like any other cell, has an electrical charge or membrane potential, and that by altering, you know, consistently uh, altering the mechanical properties of bone will disrupt that membrane potential and stimulate, you know, the activity, you know, to lay down more bone tissue. I don't know. I mean, that, that hasn't exactly been proven true. It's a decent idea, but it's not well understood. So essentially the mechanical compressive forces of bone that I mentioned before, okay, the pulling and compressing forces of playing sports are going to force bones to thicken as well because, you know, the, in, you know, bones have to become more dense Okay, to compensate for the increase in, you know, one, you know, muscle contraction, and two, in the increase of compression. Just mean M. Okay, the increase of compressive forces. And also, I want to mention as well that bones, you know, so as an adult, your bones can thicken, but they won't lengthen. Okay. So our bones can get thicker as we get older, but they can't get longer. Now, you see, this can be problematic if you take growth hormone, okay, if you take a growth hormone. If you pump yourself full of growth hormone as an adult, okay, you know, growth hormone, you know, bone is, and, you know, growth hormone has a pretty big effect on bone. So if you're, if you're continuously stimulating your bone to grow, what's going to happen, remember as an adult, those, remember I mentioned those epiphyseal plates, those growth plates, they ossify and become bone tissue. So once those growth plates just become bone tissue, you lose, you give up the ability to lengthen your bones. So then what's going to happen, our bones are going to continuously increase in width. Okay, as you're growing as a child, your bones grow in proportion, length, and width. All right, proportionally, I should say. Now, if you're an adult and you're pumping yourself full of growth hormone, okay, and you do this for a long time, your bones are going to continue to get thick and thick and thick. But if they don't lengthen in proportion to that, that's going to lead to some long term problems, like, for example, joint issues. Okay, a lot of athletes that take growth hormone wind up having knee problems. Okay, they wind up having knee problems because of this. So what happens are there, you know, like if you think of the bones of the thigh and all the other bones above there, you know, let's say, remember the knees are a big weight bearing area. Okay, those, you know, those bones are going to increase in diameter, but if they don't increase in length, that's going to add a lot more weight and those bones aren't going to be able to handle that compressive force and especially the cartilage in the knee. Okay, so then what's going to happen is you're going to wind up having bad joints, okay? I mean, think, I mean, Barry Bonds is the first guy that comes to mind with this. I don't care how much he whines and cries in front of a camera, the dude's guilty, okay? It's just he did what every professional athlete does. He said, well, no, I didn't do it, and he has to stick to his story, 
Okay. But, you know, Bonds, I mean, he retired. He didn't retire because the media was all over him or because he was getting old. It was because his knees gave out on him. Okay. And basically when the Giants were going to trade him, he wanted to go to, an, to the American League because in the American League, pictures don't bat. There's a designated hitter, and that's all the DH does is swing a bat. They don't have to run around in the outfield, like, you know, because Barry Bonds was an outfielder. And he couldn't do that anymore. Okay, so basically he put on way too much muscle mass because he was pumping himself full of growth hormone, and also his bones grew very, very thick, all right? So then as a result, he had all that excess stress on his joints, and that's why he had to retire, okay? And then, well, you know, if you pump yourself full of growth hormone, it's not just your long bones. I mean, your skull will thicken as well. I mean, people, you I mean, your head gets bigger, your extremities get bigger, all right? I mean, it's just, it's just a, don't take growth hormone, people. Um... So I know it's kind of unorganized, but um, but that's essentially bone tissue in a nutshell. You know, so when you're looking at this, I mean, kind of think about this and appreciate the strength that comes with bone tissue. You know, via its structure, and then a little bit of the understanding of, um, you know, essentially the, the the calcium homeostasis, and you know, basically how we utilize osteoblasts and osteoclasts to undergo this. So again, if you have any, you know. Uh, again, I can't say this enough. If you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, you know, contact me, and um, you know, good luck in your studies.